Okay, let's talk about the poet Walt Whitman and his long poem, Leaves of Grass. There's a short introduction to the sections from Leaves of Grass that I gave to you to read. And it mentions that Whitman was born in poverty, that he worked as a printer and so on. Uh, you might notice one of the mistakes in that intro is when it says that he worked as a nurse during the Civil War for 11 years. Actually, the Civil War only lasted four years, so that's misleading. Whitman actually was a nurse during uh, those four years and then um, beyond that as well. Also, he published the first edition of his famous Leaves of Grass in 1855, not 1955. The book that he published got no attention, and perhaps rightfully so. When you read it, you'll see it doesn't really look like poetry. What I mean by that is that what, people in 1855 knew what they wanted when they read poetry. They wanted to see stanzas. They wanted to see some form. They wanted to see lines that rhymed. They wanted to be able to tap their foot to the meter. And finally, they wanted some nice, happy sentiments about God and bunnies and trees. So when Whitman comes out with his book in 1855, people had no idea what to make of it. It's no wonder he had to write his own reviews of his book because surely nobody else was. But here's the thing. What Whitman is doing in this book is he is taking the central ideas of transcendentalism and putting them into poetic form. It, if you've heard of transcendentalism, then you may know uh, something about Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau and the other folks who look to nature for signs of divine things, much like Jonathan Edwards did, who went out into nature to experience God. The transcendentalists also believed that nature was an outward manifestation of God. Um, and that God is within everything, including our own selves. Much of the, mo most of the transcendentalists wrote essays or nonfiction pieces to share their experiences of their philosophy. And Ralph Waldo Emerson did try to write poetry in the transcendentalist vein, bless his heart. But Whitman was the one who did something entirely revolutionary and totally in keeping with transcendentalism. He wrote poetry that broke all the rules of poetry. He didn't alter his syntax so that his lines would rhyme. If you find a rhyme in Song of Myself, it's probably a coincidence or an accident. Whitman wanted to match the idea to the appropriate expression and not twist his language to fit some arbitrary form. So his poetry comes across as a kind of conversation. And in fact, he wanted it to be that way. He wanted people from all different backgrounds to be able to read his poetry and understand it. But also he wanted to bring something meaningful and consequential to his poetry. He didn't want to write silly poems about trees and bunnies and clouds. He took the actual philosophical ideas from transcendentalism and he turned those ideas into poetic expressions. So when you read Whitman's long poem, you're learning about how the transcendentalists envisioned the world. It begins, I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume you shall assume for every atom that belongs to me as good belongs to you. And already we've gone beyond the standard idea of poetry for 1855. Already, Whitman has said that he's going to brag about himself, he's going to make himself the master, and he's going to tell us that his truth is our truth. Who does he think he is, anyway? Then he goes on, I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. Loaf, invite his soul. Americans don't loaf. And they don't invite their souls. They work hard and they go to church. All this leaning and loafing can't be good for anybody. But if you are going to goof off, make sure it has some value. What does Whitman do when he's loafing? He's watching the grass grow. What a waste of time. And yet, 
there is something to it. Well, Whitman makes something of it. The grass is a perfect symbol for the transcendentalist view of the world. In the sixth section, he discusses further what the grass means. For Whitman, it's the handkerchief of the Lord. It's the child who asks the initial question, what is the grass? It's the hair of graves. But it's, it's also something that is universal and everywhere. So it's a symbol of death, the hair of graves. And it's a symbol of life, the child. And it's a symbol of finally democracy, the vast reach of grass that grows everywhere under everybody's feet, regardless of race, class, or gender. It's a very common thing, and it's also a very special thing all at once for Whitman. So in the sections that I asked you to read, he explains some of his transcendentalist philosophy, and he notes the hawk flying by for good purpose. But before all of that, in the 15th section, Whitman lists a number of people doing different things. You might read this section and wonder why it's there. Why is this crazy poet trying to bore me? Well, this section really is just a catalog of the different parts of the American experience. There's a contralto, a carpenter, a pilot, a hunter. Almost all of these people are people who are doing their work or people who are engaged in the business of life in all of its forms. It seems tedious to read, but Whitman is here trying to capture what it is to live in America. And it's never just one thing. And that's one great thing about the United States. There is such variety in the people, the languages, the customs, the way to have fun, the way to make a living, and, and so on. How could anyone hope to encapsulate all that America is in a few lines? The only way to try to do it is to make a long list. And that's what Whitman does to try to capture some small part of the American experience and the American variety. So this is Walt's book, and we're reading different portions of that long poem, Song of Myself. And we too might not see it necessarily as poetry. A lot of people in 1855 would have agreed with that assessment, but we're reading his work today because he was able to promote himself wonderfully. Whitman, KG Old Whitman, he sent a copy of his book to Ralph Waldo Emerson, the big boss of the Transcendentalists. When Emerson read it, he saw immediately that Whitman's poetry was really a poetic form of Transcendentalism. And he sat down and wrote a letter that was very complimentary to the book and to the author. And he sent it to Walt. And so Whitman, without even asking permission, took that letter from Emerson and used it as the preface for his second edition to Leaves of Grass. Now, in, in his day, Emerson was the man of letters, and the nation valued his opinion. So if he liked it, well, there must be something there. So the first edition of Leaves of Grass sold almost no copies. It sold 10 copies, and his mom bought nine of those. But the second edition, with Emerson's letter in it, sold thousands of copies. And after Whitman, after his entrance into the literary scene, American poetry would never be the same again. Now we have free verse that doesn't rhyme and doesn't have rhythm. We have poems that include long catalogs of ideas that build toward an objective. We have poetry that tries to express a deep philosophy in some way, rather than just repeat cliches about the pretty landscape. We have poetry that has content and meaning and soul. And it's not always easy. In fact, it's often hard to tug out the meaning of an American poem now, even in a rap song, which is a direct legacy of Whitman's poetry. Much of this is due to Whitman's Song of Myself. For the end, uh, in section 46, Walt tells us about his perspective and how we should learn from him by not learning anything at all from him. So as you read it, is this claim of his a contradiction or does it make sense? Just what, just what is Walt telling us about our own individual lives 